welcome to Shamblin. Welcome to another version of uh, Now That You Ask. Um, we've got a very special guest tonight, uh, but before I introduce him, I want to recognize the front row here, uh, which is made up of students of the first class of the Master's Program in Leadership Institute, the current graduating class, and uh, or the class about to graduate, and the current class. Uh, those of you in the first class, raise your hand. Oh, was I misinformed? <laughs> they didn't show, Linda. Uh, the, uh, the about to graduate. Okay. And uh, current class. Ah, they showed. <laughs> All right, well, thank you and welcome. And also, as usual, to uh, Sue Andrews and uh, Carter. And uh, glad to have you here. And Representative, glad to have you here. Uh, and um, we have a very special guest tonight. Uh, we've actually talked about having him for almost every one of these, and we said, well, no, let's get some people outside first, and then we'll bring him in. Uh, and so tonight, uh, you're in for a real treat. Uh, we're going to interview the 17th president of this university. Uh, we're not going to interview him as much about what it's like to be president of this university as we are about who he is. So I hope you'll learn some things about him tonight, but just a couple of things uh, in preamble. This university uh, enroll, student enrollment has grown 82 percent since he became the president in 2005. That's that's getting close to two to one, uh, or doubling. That's that's really an incredible statistic. And all you have to do is travel around this campus and see the mark that he's made on this university and all you have to do is travel around this community and listen to the mark he's making on this community. Um, the thing I like best though in his bio is a statement that as president of the university his priority is to cultivate students who act justly, show mercy, extend kindness, and walk humbly with the Lord. Uh, so with that I want to inter introduce and welcome President Randy Lowry. Thank you sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As with uh, each of these, we'll be very casual and relaxed. Uh, and um, at some point, I'll be turning to you for questions. And so be thinking about what you want to ask that I have not. Uh, thanks for being here. Good to be here with you, always. And just to get it off on a Good start. I, I got to ask you about something you said uh, and, and just kind of establish your credibility here on the front end. You're, you're quoted as saying that macaroni and cheese is a vegetable. Hey, I'm just quoting you folks in the South. And, uh, <laughs> I didn't make it up, uh, but I'm thrilled that's the case. Uh, in fact, I've been doing my own study of macaroni and cheese in Nashville. Oh, you have? And uh, backstage, I'll tell you. Where the best is. Well, no, no. Where's, we want to know out here on, in front of stage. Where, where is the best macaroni and cheese in I Nashville? I think the best macaroni and cheese in Nashville is uh, at J. Alexander's. Really? And uh, now, they Nanny, say it's not your ordinary macaroni and cheese, and it's not. Now, did you not have macaroni and cheese in California? Uh, well, we have Velveeta cheese, and uh, we have macaroni. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> but it's not like it is in the South. Okay. All right. Good. Well, I wanted to get out, I wanted to get that out of the way because I was questioning your credibility on that that yeah. point. Um, I, I want to talk mostly about who you are and not what you are. Um, but I, I have to start with a couple of questions about your presidency at Lipscomb because I think it's been so incredibly remarkable. Uh, most college presidents I've known. It seems to me have been educators all their life. They've wanted to be college president all their life. That you don't seem to fit that mold. Am, am I missing something, or, or or did you always want to be a college president? Well, I don't know if I always wanted to be, but uh, I uh, I was a senior at Pepperdine when I went to work for my mentor and friend Jerry Hudson, who was uh, a Lipscomb graduate and provost at Pepperdine, and within a few months of going to work for him, uh, he. Uh, in fact, it was the night I got home from my honeymoon. There was a call that said, go back to the airport, pick up somebody. Uh, he's from Hamlin University in Minnesota. And little did I know, Jerry was a uh, candidate for the presidency there. Within a few weeks, Ron and I were moving everything we had, which wasn't much, 
uh, to Minneapolis, Minnesota. And we spent uh, six years with him at Hamlin, another six years at Willamette University in Oregon. So back in, in that moment, uh, I looked out and really was attracted to higher education. Uh, mm -hmm. Along the way, I became a lawyer. And uh, there was a moment at Willamette in, uh, at the end of our time where I either had to stay in the administration or go back to Pepperdine and teach. And I thought it'd be a good idea to do some teaching, be a real faculty member for a while. Mm -hmm. So the dream kind of got put off and we had a great time at Pepperdine. And then uh, this opportunity came. Do you remember a point when, were you surprised by the opportunity when it came? Well, I'd really given up on the possibility of being a president. I was, uh, I was a finalist for the presidency at Pepperdine. That didn't uh, work my way. And then I was finalist for another school, but my brother, my brother-in-law was very, very ill and later died. And so I got to the point where I just said, okay, God, you know, I get it. You know, we've gone down this path a couple times and that's not in the cards and that's fine. Uh, started a new consulting company, teaching law, and, and, and life was perking along when all of a sudden uh, the search firm from this position called and I didn't even respond to it. And they called again, they called again, and finally on a Sunday night, uh, the search firm uh, guy called from Atlanta and he said, look, if you don't send me something tonight, you're not gonna be in the pool. And so instead of answering all the questions that they might have had, I sent a short note and then uh, things developed from there. Did he tell you why you were in the pool? Or why they wanted you in the pool? No, uh, he just, uh, you know, like these firms do, they ask lots of people and names kind of percolate mm -hmm. along. And, uh, you know, after it was all over, my sense was maybe, you know, maybe at times when we want something really bad, we don't get it. And when we give up that dream, uh, I think sometimes God can work then in a much more profound way. You didn't respond. <laughs> But initially, but did you want it really badly? No, I didn't know much about it. Uh, I'd been to Lipscomb once in my life. Uh, we used to call Pepperdine Lipscomb by the sea. Yes, we know. Uh, and uh, Pepperdine, we, for those of you who don't know, is on in Mal overlooks the ocean in Malibu. And uh, when we opened the campus there in 1972, we called it Lipscomb by the sea because there were so many faculty from here that came out there. And so I'd heard of it, but I really didn't know much about it. Been here only one time. But I thought, well, you know, this is interesting enough to uh, share uh, some time. And then they suggested I come back for an interview. And uh, that didn't seem to work out very well. Uh, Why is that? Well, the first question was something like, uh, how could we ever hire a lawyer from California to be president at Lipscomb? <laughs> and I thought, well, we, these are friendly folks. Uh, and uh, <laughs> We like macaroni and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I didn't know how to respond to that, and I probably said something I shouldn't have said, but I, I turned and I said something to the effect, I don't know if you have the courage to or not. And uh, as it turned out, that probably was the right thing to say. And, uh, but I went downstairs after the interview, and I'm down in the terminal, and I call my wife, who's in Texas, and uh, I said, you know, these are really nice people. These are wonderful people, but they're never going to hire a lawyer from California. And so I left here thinking, well, it was nice to come, nice to meet them, but nothing else will happen. And when did you know it was going to turn your way? Well, I was on the board at Abilene Christian University, and I was going there for a board meeting. And I believe the next day I got a call in the middle of the board meeting, and uh, I could tell where the number was from, walked outside. And the search firm called, and they said something that uh, led me a little bit astray. They said, you know, we've... Uh, uh, we, we've been notified by the trustees, they've ended the search. And I thought, well, okay, they've ended the search, and instead of taking three of us back to the campus, uh, but he said, no, no, they've ended the search, and you're their choice. And so uh, within a matter of minutes, I'm trying to figure out, that, well, that wasn't a real good idea in some ways, because you really do need faculty support. You really do need to know a community, and all of a sudden, they decided not to do any of that. And so... Uh, we met in Dallas uh, the next day, uh, worked out uh, what we thought was a, a good arrangement, and a short time later, moving to Nashville. So you never hesitated once you got the offer? Uh, I didn't hesitate at all, although uh, my daughter, one of them, is still mad at me. <laughs> uh, because she was at college, at Wheaton College in Illinois, 
And for her, uh, for us moving, it, was, it was, uh, seemed like a, a God kind of thing to do. For her, it was not having a home to come back to. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never will forget the words that Melinda said to me one night. She said, Dad, we didn't even pray about it. <laughs> Boy, that's an indictment, isn't it? Goodness <laughs> gracious. So, but we, uh, we love Nashville. She's here in Nashville working at Healthways, and it all turned out well. Good. Well, well, I attended high school and college here, lived on campus for four years, and it's not the place I used to be. It's very different, extraordinarily different, revolutionarily different. Uh, how have you succeeded in making so many changes in this institution with its long, strict history, uh, seemingly without firing a shot? Well, it seems to me that uh, you're, you have some advantage if you come into an institution that's in a little bit of a crisis. Uh, you're an expert in, in all of this far more than I am, but uh, enrollment had been down for several years. The budget had been adjusted for each of those years. And what I think we found was a community that was really hungry uh, for a new future, a new level of engagement, uh, a sense of success. And uh, so a little bit of a crisis, a little bit of hunger gives you the opportunity as a leader to move things fairly quickly. And uh, Lipscomb, as I, I describe it, I think, um, had not felt some of the renaissance and some schools near us have felt. Uh, Belmont started really their renaissance 10 or 15 years earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, Davidson and High Point and uh, Elon and Samford. A lot of these schools, very much like Lipscomb, had started this renaissance, had grown dramatically while the demographics helped them do that. And, and I think folks here just kind of thought, well, you know, when's it our turn? Mm -hmm. And so that was a wonderful place to come into because frankly, they probably let us lead in ways they might not today. What surprised you most about being a college president? Uh, I think what, uh, um, what surprised me most was the role that is never talked about in any of the documents. Uh, and that is, and this may not be the best way to describe it, uh, but in a sense, you're, you're the CEO of a business organization. In a sense, you're the leader of something in higher education. But in a community like this, you're also, well, I guess the best word would be a pastor uh, to the community. Mm -hmm. and, and when you have seven or eight or 900 employees, and you have almost 6,000 students, uh, there is hardly a day go by that someone in their personal life doesn't have some kind of tragedy, some kind of challenge. And uh, when I write the book, I'll never be able to include this chapter uh, out of respect uh, for these people. But uh, when you walk those walks with people, uh, it's very, very difficult. It's emotionally draining. And yet at times, it's the most satisfying thing one can do is ministering in a moment of, of real challenge. And um, that at least wasn't on the job description I read. Right. Uh, of your accomplishments here, what are you, what are you most proud? Oh, I think um, I, I'm, I'm proud of our engagement with the community. That comes to mind at least first. Uh, Lipscomb is a wonderful place, a wonderful DNA, years, decades of wonderful education. But at least when I arrived, it seemed to me like we were a little comfortable in Green Hills and a little removed from uh, whatever was going on in, in the life of the city. And so uh, people like Nelson Andrews and others encouraged me to engage. And the city has been so responsive to us. Uh, and that's been very, very satisfying. When you think about an institution that uh, the Washington Monthly reported a couple of years ago, named us the number three school in the nation in terms of the impact of students on a community. Uh, that's a pretty satisfying moment. We work with 120 nonprofit organizations. And I hope what happens is the students serve, but they also create a value of service for their life. Okay. What's left to do? Oh, a lot is left to do. Number uh, one on your list. Do. Well, I think we, um, we still probably have 30 or 40 or 50 million dollars of work to do on the campus before it is all a 21st century campus, but it has gone a long ways down that yeah. road. 
We spent about a million dollars a month for 70 months. And uh, that's remarkable during a recession. Uh, but I think we have more to do to uh, understand how to walk out uh, our spiritual, our Christian commitment in a world that's growing much more secular. Uh, the questions are a little different. The answers are very different. The conversation's very different. And in a much more diverse city of Nashville or country, uh, telling our story is something that we're going to have to be thoughtful about. Higher education's a mess. Uh, we're going through more change than we've gone through in 300 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, the chaos of this industry is something uh, boy, we have to figure out how to navigate this institution in that context. So we have some uh, attention-getting moments in the future. That spiritual-secular divide that, as you say, is getting wider makes the changes you've made here even more amazing. Uh, address that tension you must deal with in the board meetings and other places. Well, it's amazing that uh, you know we really don't deal with it as a, a crisis kind of moment. We do deal with it in the sense of saying, you know, how do you walk out a sense of faith in a world where there are many, many, many other stories? Now, that wouldn't have been true in Nashville 25 years ago, uh, but uh, today uh, we have a much more diverse community. What they say, one out of every seven people was born outside the United States that lives here. And they're going to bring faith backgrounds and cultural backgrounds, and we're going to have to navigate those with the story that, that we believe in. And uh, I think it's possible to do that. The background I have in mediation and conflict management, I think, plays into that. Uh, but uh, it will be a challenge uh, to do that. I'm concerned about a community, uh, ours or the Nashville community, you know, having a narrative that uh, makes sense with the diversity that we have. Uh, and we'll be working hard on that one. Okay. Uh, anything you haven't done that you'd hope to do by this time? Any, any big disappointments? Uh, I haven't uh, built the endowment I'd love to build. And uh, the recession took about 30 million out of it, it seems like in a day or two. Oh. And uh, building that back is really, really difficult. And that will be a huge one of our financial priorities in the next decade. You referenced uh, Belmont a while ago. Uh, I said to someone last night that the Lipscomb-Belmont rivalry, which used to be limited basket basketball and mascot defacement, uh, ha has elevated both schools to levels approaching the influence and importance of Vanderbilt, I think, in the community. Uh, how aware or how much of a factor has competition been in, in the successes you've, you've achieved here? Well, I, I think um, competition is something that's motivating every day, uh, keeps things clear uh, in, in your strategy. But our competition is not just with Belmont. Uh, when we look at uh, the cross applications to this university, we had about 4,000 applications this year. And you look at the schools that uh, students are looking at, Certainly Belmont is one, uh, Harding University and our fellowship is one, uh, but so is High Point, so is Elon, so is Samford. I mean, just a number of schools in the private category, and then we'll have a lot of cross applications with the University of Tennessee and Middle Tennessee State mm -hmm. in the state category. So uh, uh, the Belmont competition up the street is not the only thing we think about. Uh, although at least twice a year it becomes more interesting. Yeah, it, it always uh, did. <laughs> uh, all right, more about you than Lipscomb now. Okay. Where'd you come from? Came Start at the very beginning. Little town. Uh, I was born in Long Beach, California. And my parents moved to California after World War II. Uh, my dad actually became a funeral director, a mortician. And uh, my uh, uh, first five years were in Long Beach. Then we moved to a town called Redlands, California which uh, was known at the time as the naval orange capital of the world. And so I'd look out the picture window in my house and I would see uh, orange groves and then behind those uh, snow-covered mountains in Southern California. Cool. So it was a wonderful place to live. I grew up, went to high school there, and then off to college. So big transition moving to Tennessee. Well, we lived in Minnesota for six years and that was enough of those winters. No and, naval oranges. Uh, <laughs> no naval oranges. <laughs> Lived in Oregon for six years. Absolutely loved that. And uh, we absolutely love Nashville. In fact, uh, 
my house, my wife is out right now in Santa Barbara getting a little place that we own there ready to be rented because we just don't go back very much. So we're, we're Nashville. Did you ever consider being a funeral director? Uh, never considered that. I, <laughs> I, I did a number of other jobs along the way, but uh, not that. Well, what's the most, uh, uh, the strongest childhood memory? What, what? Childhood memory? Well, childhood was kind of tough. Uh, my dad left when I was about five years old. And so I grew up with a single mom and a younger sister. Really? Uh, we didn't have a lot. And uh, so uh, I, uh, I've always felt like uh, there was a bit of my life where I had to navigate somewhat alone. And uh, that's a, a challenge. Siblings? Uh, one younger sister. One younger sister. And uh, so, you know, I, I have a lot of empathy for kids that uh, are growing up and because of a variety of situations really have to make life decisions without a lot of support around. And, you know, you hope you make some of those right. I did have people that, uh, that loved me, and uh, I had a number of people that I worked for along the way that were great influences in life. Most important? Most important? Probably two Jewish men that owned a men's store I worked at. Really? And uh, well, the old man, as we called him, Jack Levine, was 75, and the younger guy was 50, Alan. And uh, it was an interesting men's store. Maybe this audience will understand this. These are two... Jewish clothiers in the most traditional sense of that industry. We had a Catholic Italian tailor, and they always hired a boy from the Church of Christ. Uh, intentionally. Intentionally. We passed <laughs> it down. Uh, whoever was a senior in high school worked at Levine's. And uh, they taught me so much about uh, treating customers, uh, so much about business. Uh, some of it uh, hard lessons uh, in the way they did business. Uh, but uh, I, I learned a lot from them. And without a dad growing up, it was really helpful to have people like that uh, that could influence me. And you did this while you were in high school? I did it while I was in high school. And uh, I went to work when I was a junior in high school, and I don't think I've ever worked less than 32 hours a week since then. So all the way through college, all the way to grad school, all the way through law school, I just didn't have the means to not work. And Some so of the jobs we don't know about. Uh, I'm a pretty good cobbler, uh, and I can rip your heels off and uh, put them back on. Really? Uh, spent a year being a cobbler, working for a guy that uh, was just wonderful. A uh, little tiny cobbler shop in Redlands, and you go into the shoe shop, and especially women would come in, and they'd say, oh, my shoes are so tight. Would you stretch them? <laughs> well, you can't really stretch <laughs> shoes. And uh, we'd, we'd, we'd sit her down, and we'd take the shoe off ever so gently. He taught me how to do this. And you'd go back and just toss it up on the table, take a hammer and pound the table a few times, take it back and sit down on your knees and gently push that shoe on. And you'd say, now, how does that feel? She said, oh, much better, much better. <laughs> uh, and uh, she'd say, what do you owe me? And it was always 25 cents. 25 cents. Whatever, whatever it was, always 25 cents. And she'd go out, and somebody else would come back in. Well, that's good enough. I got to ask you what the next job you remember. Well, I worked my uh, worked my way through uh, through college by working in the crime lab of a sheriff's department, and that was fascinating work. And uh, long CSI. before well, long before CSI, <laughs> we weren't nearly that sophisticated. But it's the largest county. San Bernardino County is the largest county in America in terms of land mass. Goes all the way to Nevada, and so. Uh, uh, when uh, somebody would get knocked off in Las Vegas, they'd drag that body across the state line. And we wouldn't, have, we, we wouldn't find it immediately. Uh, sometimes it wasn't for weeks or months or whatever. But they'd bring it in the crime lab, and we'd get to do all the investigation. And uh, some of it was kind of glamorous and interesting. Some of it was awful. Because I had to spend a couple hours every day uh, uncorking the blood vials from DUI arrests and pouring the blood down a sink. And so I'd, I'd, have, I'd have blood all over my white lab coat by the end of the day. Because they were no longer needed? Or they were no longer needed. destroying evidence? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, the trial had already taken place, and you had to do something with okay. it. And you couldn't uh, just throw it away because it had the label, someone's name on it. So right. you had to take the label off. And so uh, that was kind of yucky. But uh, I, I learned along the way I was allergic to marijuana. Really? Yeah. And, and how did you uh, learn that? Well, I learned that because when we'd have a big bust and we'd bring a lot in, I'd sneeze a lot. Oh. And uh, so they'd say, go get Lowry. Take a whiff. 
<laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. So you were the marijuana dog. So I was the marijuana dog. <laughs> and, uh, so we handled all the drug uh, stuff at the county, and there was a lot of it. I love it. Uh, so you never tried it? I never tried it. That's good. I'm glad I shouldn't have asked that. I actually. breathed it. Uh. But, uh, <laughs> I never smoked it. Oh. That wasn't an unfair question. For that wasn't an unfair answer. question. <laughs> I didn't ask that. But so I, I gave, gave you the right answer. Uh, you, you would have been entitled to give me the answer you gave the woman a better shoe. Um, <laughs> the uh, uh, so grade school in Redlands, Redlands, and high school in Redlands. Redlands. So you stayed in the same place mm -hmm. through that period of time. What did you think you were going to be when you grew up? I always thought I'd be a lawyer. Really? And didn't and know much about what a lawyer was, but I had a grandfather who was a lawyer, my dad's father, and uh, I hardly, I mean, I didn't ever know him. He died the year I was born. But he was a lawyer in Oklahoma, and I was always amazed at, at what I heard about him. He was out in western Oklahoma. He was superintendent of schools and also a lawyer and took a great interest in Native American cultures and people. And he was the kind of lawyer that would do something for you and you'd have to pay him with food from the garden or whatever. Mm -hmm. So he never was very wealthy or successful that way. Uh, but he actually ran for the legislature in Oklahoma and he was uh, in the legislature when they impeached a governor. So had kind of an interesting career and there was enough of that that I just thought, well, okay, I'm supposed to be a lawyer. And what about that appeal to you? Um, I think it appealed to me because he was well respected in town. He seemed to be doing things that were productive and, and interesting. And that's nothing like most lawyers practice, yeah. but it seemed interesting to me. So I majored in political science, which uh, I, I'm always amazed that people say, what should you major in if you want to be a lawyer? Political science has nothing to do with it. <laughs> uh, you ought to major in English because you're going to get tested on how you that's communicate. Right. Uh, you should major in music. You're going to get tested on how you think. Uh, so there's some other majors that are better, but uh, I have a bachelor's in political science and then a master's in public administration, and that all led to law school. Did you ever think about running for office? I thought about it. Um, Which but, office? Uh, well, I, I, you know, I, I've thought about local things, but you know, I, I think some of the most unsung heroes in the world are school board members. And you know, that's kind of the first step mm -hmm. in a lot of political stuff. But, oh, my goodness, the work you have to do and the flack you have to take to try to navigate that. Yeah. So yeah. I've just never had the opportunity at the right time, but um, have thought about it. Interesting. Okay. We'll keep that in mind. Well, um, maybe you could advise me sometime. Your uh, grade school, high school, a, f a best friend you remember and why? Well, I uh, probably... Uh, Probably one of my best friends was a young man by the name of Bruce who had uh, cerebral palsy and uh, all through uh, elementary school and high school uh, was a friend of mine and for many years I pushed his wheelchair mm. and uh, this is back in the days we didn't have electric wheelchairs and all of that and uh, Bruce was a good friend passed away when he was 22 23 years old uh, but uh, we spent a, a lot of time together I only dumped him once uh, tacky, tacky day, but uh, it was down about six stairs, and I should have caught the wheelchair and didn't, and I never will forget the scene of Bruce tumbling out and rolling down those chairs and my trying to tell him why that was okay, uh, but uh, wonderful, wonderful family um, and good friend. Heroes growing up? Heroes growing up. Um, well, uh, one of my hero might be a little strong, but one of the people that uh, I was always amazed at uh, was a dean at Pepperdine by the name of Frank Pack. Uh, he was dean of Bible and the graduate school. And uh, I was so impressed with Frank Pack because when he would come to preach at our church, he was the first person I'd ever met or knew of that had his initials on his shirt. And I thought that was so cool. <laughs> I mean, somebody could actually have initials on their shirt. <laughs> and uh, he dressed extraordinarily well and uh, actually was responsible for the scholarship I got that allowed me to go to Pepperdine. Oh, cool. So, helpful guy. The, um, what, what, it, growing up, what did, you, you started working early in life. Right. At what, at what age? Well, I was a junior in high school, so about 17, I guess. How did you spend your time otherwise as a youth? 
Well, I didn't have much time to spend if you put 32 hours a week in and then you go to school. Uh, I, I didn't have a lot of time. I did a lot of church and good youth group, and that was a great influence on life. But really, work and church and school uh, were about it. Sports? Uh, you know, I, I was uh, not very good. Um, I remember at 12 years old, I played my first year of Little League. Now, that's not a good idea. You know, you're supposed to start yeah. a lot younger, yeah. right? A little younger. But uh, mom didn't have a lot of, you know, sports in her. And so uh, I finally played Little League my uh, first year at 12, and that was called the majors back then, which might imply they knew what they were doing. And uh, I never will forget the last day of a Little League, the coach handed out these mimeograph sheets. You remember what those looked mm -hmm. like? Mm -hmm. And they were the stats for the season. And uh, I never will forget looking at that. And they were arranged in order. And so I looked at the top of the page and started looking for my name. <laughs> and I got all the way down to the bottom of the page, and there I was. My batting average was point zero, zero, zero. Ooh. Never had a hit in my entire Little League career. But, but, but don't feel too sorry for me. I learned how to get on base. Because I learned if you leaned over far enough, they would hit you. Uh, <laughs> and they did that over and over again. And so I got on base a lot. I scored lots of runs. I just never, uh, never got a hit. So uh, I've taken a lot of interest in my own children and the athletic uh, um, success they've had, but didn't have much myself. Okay. I'm going to come to you in a minute if you want to be thinking about your questions. Uh, were you a reader? Did you uh, TV watcher, movies? No, probably not. I, I, in high school, spent a lot of time in speech and debate, and that really defined all the extracurricular mm -hmm. stuff because that's every single Saturday going to a debate tournament somewhere. And I found that very stimulating intellectually, a lot of reading and research that went into that. And uh, that's really uh, the way I went to Pepperdine is on a debate scholarship. So early on, that uh, really captured me. I had a, a teacher by the name of Mrs. Backus, who was uh, a German a woman about 65, maybe, yeah, about 65 years old. And she was very much from the old school of everything. I never will forget the first day of my sophomore year of high school. I walked into a speech class, and her message to us was this. She said, uh, she said, most of you will not stay with me. But she said, those that do, I'll change your life. And I actually believed it. Uh, <laughs> and she was actually right. And if you look at the people that came out of that high school, uh, people like James Fallows, who was mm -hmm. speechwriter to uh, Jimmy Carter, mm -hmm. just a number of outstanding folks came out of that high school speech class. And I always thought it was... Uh, uh, hard work, uh, but always an honor, uh, and something precious was happening with that hard work and with her. Was she your favorite teacher, if you think back well, over be, all of them? She certainly was my most influential teacher. Uh, favorite was hard to describe her as, but uh, I remember Friday nights, I'd go to school, I'd work at Levine's till 9 o'clock, then I'd go over to her house, and we'd work with her and her husband for a couple hours, getting ready for the debate tournament the next day. And uh, she, was, she was not easy, but as life turns out, uh, she became good friends with my mother. And uh, so after her husband died, I'm really the one that took care of her the rest of her life. Wow. And so I remember moving her into a nursing home, and I preached her funeral. And uh, wow. so it was really a, a very sweet and interesting uh, end-of-life relationship as well. Interesting. Very interesting. Question? Baron. Counselor. As you've described, you, you have so many demands on your time in this community, and you're deeply involved in the community. I know a lot of things with me and uh, the rest of the community. What do, you, what do you do, how do you manage that? How do you prioritize? Is there a system you have or is it luck? Or what do you do to keep all of this in, in, in the correct priority? It's interesting you would ask that. I was at the airport in Atlanta yesterday and I bought a new book on time management. Uh, so I, I'm not sure I would suggest I do that all that well. 
uh, you know, this job really is one where you, uh, where you work 14, 16 hours a day. That's not all that unusual. Lots of people do that. Uh, but you do that with a host of very, very different activities in a 14-hour day. And um, I don't know that I have the secret to that at all. I have two wonderful people in my office that work very hard to help those days be uh, productive. Um, I think if it had to be priority, uh, certainly one priority I would try to have is people and the challenges they have and, and those need to take priority over lots of other stuff. Uh, I try to get lots of places because it's important to show sincerely interest in what that nonprofit's doing, what this group of students are doing. I mean, the old showing up really does have a, a lot to do with it. Uh, but I think it's got to be sincere, and it's, it's got to be real uh, for it to be uh, meaningful. Um, and I go to bed at night, and I'm utterly exhausted, but I sleep really well, and it's amazing what God gives us in terms of this refreshment. And eight hours later, you get up and go at it again. And uh, that's not different than lots and lots of other people in the world, and frankly, uh, I don't work nearly as hard as many of the people that work at the university and work for us. Uh, I, so um, it, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing, but it's, it's a challenge. And uh, if you've got any secrets, uh, <laughs> let me know, as I'd love to incorporate them in it all. Okay. Another question? And how did, how did you know what direction to take Lipscomb? You know, I really didn't. Um, you know, when I arrived, it, it appeared to me that uh, the leadership of the university, the board, was trying to define the college by what was happening to it. And I remember our first board meeting, one of the things I said is I said, uh, you know, you're going to have to decide if you're going to downsize the school to reflect the reality you're experiencing or if you're going to invest in the school to create what you want to create. Now, that didn't sound all that profound, but that was an interesting board meeting. And they didn't exactly know what that meant, so they sent me away and I came back a few weeks later. And they said, what will it take to turn the institution to have kind of the same success that the Renaissance has had with other schools? And I uh, had figured it out, I said $54 million. And for a group of people that have been you know, trying to adjust it to what was happening, 54 million is a lot of money. Yeah. And I never will forget, they, uh, they said, you know, here's the plan, go to it. And I walked down to the bank and had lunch with um, the head of SunTrust. And he said, what do you need? And I, over lunch, said $32 million. And I never will forget what he said because it would never be said today. But he said, well, Randy, that'll take me about 10 days. Now, that would never happen today. But 10 days later, we had $32 million. And now the question is, how do you invest it strategically? You know, how do you not miss, because you can't go back to the well again. Right. And um, you know, what we've done is create about 50 to 60 new academic programs, hired about 150 new faculty. And what I'm blessed with is a community that uh, is willing to engage just as hard as I engage uh, in this very difficult time in higher education. Uh, to be very, very creative and very, very innovative. Uh, our College of Pharmacy out here is the result of a faculty member who wrote a one-page letter and said, I think we ought to start a College of Pharmacy. I didn't know anything about it. Uh, but $12 million later, it was on its way and doing very, very well. So I think there's some really fundamental questions that if you ask them, send you in directions that you may not be able to completely script out or predict. Uh, but answering that first one right was very, very significant. Good question. It seems to be, oh, following up on Councillor Trogger's question, you don't just work 14, 16 hours a day, Monday through Friday. Uh, the president of the university with fundraising and everything, a lot of weekends. What, what do you do when you're not working? Or is there a time you're not working? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I sleep eight hours a night and I sleep very, very well. Uh, in terms of just sheer pleasure kinds of things, you know, there's not much of that as you would define it, but look at the joy that I have in a community like this. Uh, you know, you have, to, you have to realize that your, your pleasure is watching this group perform Les Mis on Saturday night. 
Your pleasure is watching Lipscomb beat Belmont on Friday night. Uh, your pleasure is, and so you're in the lives of people, but, but there's a lot of joy there. And uh, I think there's as much joy there as there probably would be if I was playing golf regularly or doing this or doing that. Uh, you do need to stop every now and then, and uh, that's hard for me. Uh, but I, I do find after two or three weeks without a weekend uh, that it's really healthy to uh, take a day or two. And what do you do on those days? Uh, if I had my druthers, I'd go to Amelia Island and uh, sit on the balcony and watch the ocean uh, and do relatively little for a little while. Uh, last time I was down, I uh, slept almost all the, the second day. And then I woke up and felt good and had a good time. Ready to go back to work. Well, not quite. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Another question. I've heard you quote uh, your grandson a couple of times in speeches. What are you hoping that Lipscomb and the world that he will face will turn into? Well, that's a great question. Weston will be seven years old next week. And, uh, boy, I, I have some real, real serious moments when I think about uh, trying to predict the world he will live in. Part of it will be exciting. Uh, I mean, in terms of technology and some of those things, uh, he will have experiences and opportunities we can't imagine. Uh, on the other hand, uh, his world is not going to be as easy to define. And, and things like values and morality and faith and all of those things aren't going to be as easy to achieve. And so um, I... Uh, I ponder what kind of, of world that will be. Uh, I'm concerned about privacy. And I think it's fascinating we have all this technology, but I'm absolutely profoundly affected by what that means in terms of, of, of privacy. And, and how do we value privacy and what might be private and what expectations do we have? Uh, you know, there will be things like that that might have been predicted in Future Shock or Orwell or somebody, but we're going to get to live part of those, and they're going to define the world he lives in. So I think there's some real challenges there. Uh, I hope he grows up and is well-educated. I hope that uh, all my grandchildren have a sense of faith, um, and I hope that that will help them navigate um, a difficult world. Say a little more about the privacy concern, as it practically might affect your grand. Well, I, I think it's just amazing to see how quickly we have given privacy up for technology. Uh, without much of an argument, without much of a fight, uh, and, and all of a sudden, you know, by the time we realize it, it's way, way too late. I mean, I love the fact that I can, you know, get on an app on my phone and I can say, ah, oh, what's, where's the closest Starbucks, right? And I can push a button. Uh, and it will tell me how to walk there or drive there. But then you do have to think, how does it know where you are? How to tell me <laughs> how to walk there or drive there? It knows that because it knows where I am. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, and when you get into all the sophistication we have now in terms of buying habits, for instance, and all the ways that'll be pushed back to us, I mean, I think there is a place there where generations ahead of us will long to just walk out in a field and feel the wind and see the trees and somehow be disconnected from all of that. And the question is, will they ever be able to? We're thinking about it. I understand. We're thinking about it. You've had such a varied career in a way, much of it in education, but law, uh, conflict management, mediation. Um, is there another career after college president? I don't think so. Uh, I, I've thought about uh, I'm 61 years old, and that's interestingly, it's the average for college presidents in America. So the days I'm really tired and feel really old, I remind myself, that's just the average, Randy. Uh, <laughs> so uh, college presidents last a little while. Um, and, and so there probably is one more something but what I'd like it to be is here at Lipscomb, uh, and I'd like to see the next part of this thing that will happen uh, that can only happen after you do the first six or eight years. Uh, you know, you spend six or eight years trying to connect to a community, trying to connect to those that support the institution. Uh, you know, you spend a lot of time with that investment. The average college president 
is president less than six years. So what happens is they then go to another institution and do what? They do that first six years over again. And you do the first six years over again. I'm really excited to think about what that second six years might be like. And, and I think that it is probably the result of some of that foundational work uh, and that well, what will happen to this institution if all is kind of equal around it uh, is even more profound the next six years uh, compared to the last. Well, I think we're all excited that you're excited about that. Uh, another question. Is there another one? Did, I, did you see a hand I didn't see? Good. Yeah, President Lowry. Um, my question is that um, you mentioned that how when you came, the, you saw the hunger and also saw that as an opportunity and how Nashville is more diverse and there will be more, more conversation to be had or more questions to be raised. Um, how do you see that Lipscomb shaping those uh, conversations or maybe raising those questions, maybe leading the way? Well, if, uh, if you were here eight years ago when I came, you'll recall that one of the very first conversations we had uh, was a conversation with Jewish, Muslims, and Christians, and it may have been one of the first conversations like that that occurred in Nashville. And uh, you may go back and read the Tennesseans' report about all of that and some of the controversy that happened, but you know, coming from Southern California, it's a little bit more comfortable for me to see the, I think, the advantages of a uh, multicultural community. And, and I think it's a little harder for Nashville to see that because, uh, frankly, for generations, black and white have kind of defined the city. But there's a growing Hispanic population. Uh, there's a large Kurdish population. Uh, there is just change going on. And, and while we may have great disagreements with each other, and while cultures may clash, and while faith may be very different, um, I don't know how it gets better if you're not in conversation, if you're not in dialogue. Uh, I think that's the only place where you learn to appreciate each other first and then can turn to all those things that may be divisive uh, or challenging. So uh, I hope Nashville will respond that way. Uh, and. Uh, I think it will be a richer community uh, if it will do so. Uh, coming from Los Angeles, where the majority population is Latino, uh, it's interesting for me to watch this community and see a growing Latino population. And we uh, are reaching out to them from this university and have wonderful Latino students here. Uh, but a lot of Nashville just doesn't realize uh, that that population is here and the tremendous uh, values they bring. I, I love our Latino students because they generally have families that are passionate about education. Uh, and it's not uncommon for them to have aunt so-and-so and uncle so-and-so and a lot of people helping a student go to college. And that passion allows us in education then to, uh, to be even that much more effective. Okay, over here. One of the things within the uh, Church of Christ, we tend to put more faith in our tradition than faith in our faith. I think your leadership from a university standpoint has been exhibited through the fact of your faith leading you to what you've done with each and every decision. And I thank you for the job that you've done. But with that being said, who is the most impressive individual you have ever met? Great question. Um. Well, in terms of sheer intellect, uh, it's probably Kenneth Ken Starr, uh, the special prosecutor in the Clinton administration and uh, the dean at Pepperdine for a couple of years. Just a brilliant, brilliant guy. And uh, someone who I feel uh, pretty lost in the conversation with pretty quick, but longing to keep up. Uh, so I, I think there's something uh, remarkable there. Uh, Terry Waite, uh, who will be here later this year. You remember him from the, the hostage negotiations in the Middle East? Uh, Terry, uh, his story is just so profound, and his spirit just is so uh, attractive. And uh, so uh, I think he's uh, someone who uh, I would find uh, you know, very interesting to spend the day with, as, as we will do later this year. Um, I think there are people that uh, you know are in almost any category we might think about, but those two come to mind very quickly. Okay. Over 
here. I'd like to ask, um, kind of piggybacking off of the last gentleman's question, do you see the university, I guess, in current state of affairs between the church and the university, will the university lead into tomorrow or will the church lead into tomorrow? And just kind of expound on your thoughts on that relationship. Yeah, I think the, uh, the wisdom is generally for colleges that are faith-based to let their churches lead. Uh, because we've got a lot to worry about, and grabbing that kind of change in a church body is probably uh, uh, a challenge. In reality, I don't think it works that way. Uh, I think because of the vitality of an academic community, we're probably talking about things long before the church is going to get there. And, uh, and, and trying to remind the church that there is uh, a difference between the church and a university. Our primary job is education, and our primary job is to prepare young people so they can be confident uh, in the careers that they choose uh, in the world. That's what they pay us for. Uh, the church has another agenda as primary, but then we share, don't we? Because the church educates, and we are very, very interested in spiritual formation and character development. So, so there is some crossover there, uh, but uh, uh, you, you don't want to... Uh, take on the change in a church, especially in our fellowship, which is so completely unorganized. Uh, we don't have a denominational structure, so, you know, what part of it do you go to? Where do you go? When do you, I mean, it's just so difficult. Uh, I think it ends up being something where our Christian colleges have a, a larger form of leadership than they might in some other church bodies. Uh, trying to navigate it, it's interesting. Uh, wonderful people who have strong passion, and uh, that's what religion's all about, but that passion sometimes is hard to manage. But I think if we understand the difference uh, and the roles that we both have, uh, it's at least a good starting place. Okay. Another question? Right here. What is the university community at large doing to support the governor's efforts to ensure a higher percent of college graduates in the state of Tennessee to ensure we keep good jobs coming in? Well, I think it's uh, very, very important that we all support the governor in, in that initiative. It's a very ambitious initiative with the, the target that he has set. Um, you know, we don't have much influence statewide. We have a lot of influence on this institution. And as uh, you've said, we've almost doubled the enrollment. Uh, our job is to uh, provide access on the front end and to graduate people on the other end. Uh, access is uh, something that has to do with uh, money many times, has to do with resources, has to do with populations. And uh, we're working hard with community college students, Latino students, veteran students, just a lot of groups to say, here's a university that welcomes you and makes it uh, relatively easy for you to come in and, and, and get that job done. Uh, on the other hand, you've got to get them graduated. And uh, one of the things I found is it's somewhat easier sometimes to admit students than it is to walk across the stage and, and graduate them. And so we have a whole new student success center and full-time people that do nothing but kind of grab them where they are and, and help them be successful in this college experience. Uh, one of the things that's kind of interesting that I think is left out of our conversation uh, is the role of private schools in helping accomplish that. Most people don't know that more than 40% of all the degrees given in Tennessee in a single year will be given by private schools. And we don't get the same play because the government doesn't support us the same way, but the private sector is a very large and vital and frankly, more nimble part of this higher education marketplace. And uh, I hope the governor will continue to look to us and will continue to be responsive to him uh, because that's a big chunk of what could lead to success. We talked a little about your grandson. I know family is a big thing to you, and some of us know that uh, you don't just have a spouse, you have a partner uh, in many ways. Uh, t tell us. Tell us a little about you and Rhonda and how you got together and, and, and how that partnership works. Well, she hates me saying this, but the night I met her, 
I thought she was married to a Pepperdine faculty member. Uh, and uh, so I had to be kind of careful. You know, you get that, don't you? Uh, uh, I uh, met her at church the Sunday night before Pepperdine opened the Malibu campus. And uh, she actually took me on our first date. She was working at a bank, and they had rented out the entire Disneyland. And uh, so uh, she took me and about six others uh, on our first date. And she didn't know it was our first date, but six I other, thought it was our Six first other guys? Date. Uh, well, some guys and some girls. <laughs> and, uh, but I did position myself strategically on the Matterhorn. Uh, oh. And uh, so uh, uh, after that first date, we got to know each other a little bit, and then uh, um, things worked out from there. We got married about three years later. Uh, so she's a Pepperdine product, uh, is tremendously talented, and you're exactly right. Uh, as I look at one of the blessings of this role, it's, it's a blessing that our children, frankly, are raised uh, through college, and we're not trying to manage that too. And it's a great blessing to have Rhonda and her talent. Uh, she's a better fundraiser than I am. She's much more intuitive about people than I am. And she has just walked this journey side by side. Those of us who know you, they'll also know that there's a lot of passing, <coughs> in the, passing in the night because of two very, very busy schedules. How do you stay connected? Uh, sometimes we don't. Uh, she called last night and I said, where are you again? <laughs> I was asleep. And she's in California and I'm here. She'll be uh, marching in the inauguration for the new president at Fuller Seminary tomorrow. So we, we do have moments where uh, for days, sometimes for a week, we're on two different agendas. Um, that works out. That really works out fine. Uh, it uh, is something where we get to share when we get back together and we both feel motivated and passionate about what we're doing. So I think at this time in life, it, it works okay. Okay, great. Uh, one question I like to ask, because we've learned of interesting things about several people. We know you were, you, we found out you were a cobbler. Tell us one other thing we don't know about you. Uh, well, one thing you might not know is I almost died in Yosemite. That's uh, a good start. That was uh, Not a good start, but tell us about it. <laughs> <laughs> I was in high school, and seven of us decided, guys, uh, I was about a junior maybe, and uh, decided we'd hike 72 miles on the John Muir Trail. And uh, that's a beautiful, beautiful trail that goes across the, uh, the Sierra Pacific Mountains there. And so we left Little Yosemite Valley, and the first day you just hike almost upstairs to get out of the valley. And we had six days ahead of us, and that night we camped. Uh, it was about 8 or 9 o'clock, this is August, <coughs> and we saw these clouds coming, and they were really dark clouds. And we didn't have rain gear, uh, probably had a windbreaker, but nothing much. We didn't have snow gear, and uh, by uh, <coughs> 10 or 11 that night, uh, all of a sudden, uh, it's snowing. And uh, we're trying to keep a fire going. All of our food was dehydrated food. So it's a little hard to cook dehydrated food when you don't have a fire and don't have boiling water. And uh, by uh, midnight, 1 or 2 in the morning, it was beginning to get kind of serious and kind of cold. Now think about this for a moment. It finally dawned on us that it's a little hard to find the trail in a foot of snow. And so we knew where we were camped. We knew where we were supposed to be going. But there's a foot of snow on the ground, and we're really, really cold. And so we stayed up about 36, maybe 40 hours, uh, and finally uh, found a, 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 an abandoned base camp. And I never will forget, we broke into a tent that was there, kind of a tent on a wooden platform. And we broke into it. There was nobody there. And there was a sign on the stove that said, you know, do not destroy this sign. Uh, well, the sign was also saying, you know, you're not supposed to start a fire. You're not supposed to cook. You're not supposed to do all these things. So the first thing we did is burn the sign. Uh, and then we didn't feel any Christian guilt from there on about, uh, uh, but we stayed there for a number of hours and eventually hiked out. And we got back to our church and it was just like Tom Sawyer. We get back on a Wednesday night, we're up in the balcony as they're praying for us. Uh, and they're down there praying for us. They didn't know we were found. I uh, didn't know we were back yet. And they're praying that we would be saved and we were. 
So uh, it was, uh, it was uh, you know, looking back, it's a wonderful experience to talk about. At the time, it was pretty frightening. And uh, How'd you break the news to them downstairs from the balcony? Uh, well, we let them pray for a while. Let we them thought, pray. Uh, <laughs> you know, they needed to see God's work right here. <laughs> and, uh, then we went downstairs, right. and we got calls for several days from families all over the place saying, you know, we heard you were there. Uh, did you see so-and-so, or did you see whatever? It was just a freak snowstorm in August in Yosemite. Wow frightening for us. Great. Thank you very much. This is very interesting. We could go on, but we'd like to finish on, start on time and finish on time. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you Great. and to be with all of you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And uh, in uh, November, Linda? February. February. Uh, 20th. Our next, now that you ask, our guest will be John Meacham, uh, who is uh, a, a former uh, Editor-in-Chief of Newsweek, a Pulitzer Prize-winning author whose uh, latest book on Jefferson is uh, getting great reviews. We hope you'll uh, rejoin us then, and uh, thank you for being here tonight.